This is one of the cheapest PCs that you can build right now for both gaming and live streaming. It'll only cost you around $400 and I'm going to show you how to find those deals or at least show you other parts that you can find that may not be exactly the same as mine that'll work just as good. We're going to show you how to put it together and install all the drivers and windows so that you're ready to play those games. Then at the end we're going to benchmark it in just raw gaming performance when you're not streaming and you're just playing with the boys versus when you are actually streaming and how it's going to affect your performance to see if it's really worth it for the games that you want to play and stream. Let's get started. The motherboard is where I like to start with any PC build. For this PC build, we went with the B550 Micro ATX motherboard. We got a really good deal on it on eBay for only around $65. The reason we went with the B550 is because it has the most upgradability and that Gen 4 support that you want for your CPU and GPU as you upgrade in the future. I would not pay more than $65 or $70 for a used one because you can get new ones now for around $80. When I'm getting it ready to build, I just open it up and put it on top of whatever box it come in or you can just use a cardboard box if you don't have one because you know it's used. Now we're going to install the CPU into the motherboard and for the CPU in this build we use the Ryzen 5 3600. It's got six cores and 12 threads and a boost clock speed of 4.2 gigahertz which is absolutely perfect for this cheap gaming PC that we're going to build today. Now to install this CPU you're going to take the lever on the motherboard and move it out to the side a little bit as you're pressing down and lift it up. This will get it ready to put the CPU in. Now you want to be very careful handling the CPU because these AM4 CPUs have very tiny pins at the bottom that can easily be bent so just be very very careful. The position of the CPU really matters and there's a little arrow in the bottom corner that you want to make sure lines up with the little arrow on the motherboard. Now they're kind of hard to see so if you're struggling with that just make sure that you have the letters lined up exactly the way I do here and you will be just fine. Gently drop that end and it'll just fall into place. You will not have to force it at all. Once it's into place just gently lower the lever back down and put it back under the little hook that it came out of to start with and now the CPU is installed. Every CPU needs a cooler and for this build for the Ryzen 5 3600 we're just going to use the stock cooler. That'll be plenty for what we need it for but if you really just wanted a cooler option no pun intended. You could use the ID Cooling SE214XE that is only around $17 on Amazon and it'll keep it quite chilly and absolutely great to add some flair to your build. Now to install the stock cooler, you are going to need a back plate for your motherboard. If you bought it used, it should come with it, but you never know. So you might have to pick one of these up only for like $7 off eBay. But if your motherboard did have a back plate, you may have to unscrew these two screws at the top and bottom that hold these little plastic casings on for different types of coolers, but we do not need them for this stock cooler. Now, if you're using an older stock cooler, it may not have pre-applied thermal paste, so you're going to want to put your own thermal paste on there. This might be something else you have to buy, so it'll be about $7 off Amazon, but you absolutely need thermal paste. For the AM4 CPUs, I just put a little big dab in the middle, and that's perfectly fine. Now, typically on stock coolers, you want to take the AMD logo and kind of turn it to the left when you place it down on top of the motherboard. Mine is actually in the upright position because I took it apart and twisted it, but you do not have to do that. That is just an extra step that I like to do. Totally not necessary. You want to line the four screws up on the cooler with the four holes that are on the motherboard, and we're going to screw them in just a little at a time going in a little X pattern like you see here. Once I have them all just a little bit tight and started, I go back through the same pattern again until I get them snug. You do not have to over tighten these at all. Then the last thing you want to do is plug up the fan header. Somewhere on your motherboard, you should see one that says CPU fan. That's where you want to plug in this little four pin cord, just like you see here. Line it up real nice and plug it in and your cooler is set and ready to go. Hey, post edit here. If you notice, there says CPU underscore OPT and then CPU underscore fan. You actually want to plug it into the bottom one is for the CPU fan. It will not hurt your PC if you don't do this, but it will give you an error when you first boot it up. So make sure you do that. I had to fix this after I booted and did not go back and film it so there you go let's install the ram next that is arguably the easiest part of building a gaming pc for the ram we want to make sure the ram is running in dual channel so what that means is here we have four ram slots the two on the left are one channel and the two on the right are the other channel most commonly called channel a and channel b if you're looking at your motherboard with the ram slots on the right of the cpu we're going to put one in the second ram slot and we're going to put another ram stick in the fourth ram slot this will make sure that it's running in dual channel and give us the best performance each motherboard could be different so you can consult your motherboard manual if you would like to make sure that is optimal for that specific motherboard. For this build, we are using two 8 gig sticks of RAM from Team Group running at 3600 megahertz. AM4 CPUs really like that extra speed. To install the RAM, all you want to do is pull the tabs back on the two RAM slots we talked about previously. Make sure the little notch that's here on the RAM is lined up with the little notch that's on the RAM slot on the motherboard. Once you have all that lined up, just push down and you will hear one or two clicks depending on how your pressure is. The RAM slots will close automatically. You do not need to manually 
manually close them back. If you do that, it's probably not seated properly. Those clicks you hear are the RAM doing what it's supposed to do, and it should be seated properly. We're going to install the SSD next, and for this build, we used an M.2 SSD that the customer gave us and wanted to put in this build. But if you're wanting to copy this build at home, I recommend going with a Gen 4 SSD that's around one terabyte at the least. You can pick these up anywhere from around like $42 to $50 pretty easily on Amazon. I'll have a few linked down below. Silicon Power and MSI are two of the brands that I use most commonly. Now, when you install this SSD, you want to use the topmost M.2 slot here on your motherboard. That's the one that's typically made for your Gen 4 or your highest supported speeds that you have for your motherboard. Now, your motherboard should come with a standoff here at the end and a little bitty tiny screw that you're going to need to install this SSD. You want to take the SSD and kind of go in at an angle like you see here, and it will just gently slide into place. You do not have to force it. Once you have it into place, it's going to stay at kind of that angle, and you're just going to gently press it down with one finger and put the screw into the standoff with the other side and gently screw it in just real snug you don't have to over tighten this thing at all that's all there is to installing this unless your motherboard has some sort of heat sink then you would actually put that on top of the ssd but this motherboard did not come with one so we're good to go on this build now for the case we chose to use in this video we just had one laying around that a customer told us we could have when we upgraded their pc but you can find cases on new egg around 50 to 60 dollars that come with fans already installed and i highly recommend that if it's your first time ever building a gaming pc i'll have some of my favorites linked down in the description now we can put the motherboard inside the case before we do this though we have to do a couple things your motherboard has holes around the outer edge and some in the middle that are supposed to line up with what we call standoffs inside your pc case a lot of the time standoffs will already be inside your pc case but they might not be for the same size motherboard you're using so you may have to unscrew the standoffs and move them around so that they're exactly lined up with the ones on your motherboard after you have all that lined up you want to put in your io shield next because if you don't do this next, it will be very painful and you'll have to undo everything to put it in. This particular build I had did not have an IO shield, but I do have a clip from an older PC that I've built before that does have an IO shield. And all you have to do is make sure it's lined up the exact way your motherboard's going to go into your PC and just snap it into place. Once you have the IO shield in, you just gently lay down your motherboard on top of your case and line up all the holes and line it up with your IO shield nice and smooth. Make sure your IO shield's not covering up any of your ports because that will also be problematic. Then you want to find these fine threaded screws that are the motherboard screws. Sometimes they're labeled when you buy a case, sometimes they're not, but they kind of look like this. Screw them all in nice and snug and your motherboard is installed and you're ready to go to the next step. Now we're going to install the power supply. And for this build, we used a 650 watt power supply we had in stock here for this customer. But if I were you building this at home, I would get the Apivia 600 watts, gold certified for only $52. The Apivia power supply will already have the cords there. It is not a modular power supply. So what you'll want to do is flip it over with the fan facing down and slide it into the back side of your case into this compartment here and use the four thicker screws that will mount it solidly into place. As you're doing this though, you wanna make sure you kinda of pull all the cords out to the back so that you got plenty of room to kinda of move them around. Once you have it mounted nice and snug, what you're gonna do is run some of the cables so you'll have it ready to plug into your motherboard. The first cable is the CPU cable. It goes in the upper right hand spot. There'll be a little hole there. It could be a little tight squeeze for you to get it through that hole depending on how big your case is. So sometimes it'll take a little work, but you should be able to get it through the hole in most cases. Next, I like to take the 24 pin and it will kind of go on the left hand side of the motherboard on the side and we'll kind of run it towards the front so that you can see and get to it easy. And the last one is for the graphics card. Depending on what your power supply says, it will say PCIe or something like that, or it could say GPU, depending on your brand of power supply. And I normally like to run them underneath the motherboard coming out the bottom of the case, but some of the cases are really tight right there, so you may have to run it around the side like you did the 24 pin. Next up is a SATA connector. This is where you will plug up older hard drives or SSDs maybe that you would like to use in the future. Sometimes fans are also powered by this. All you gotta do is make sure you line everything up and snap them in together. With the excess cord, I like to tuck them up under the power supply. There's also an older connector than that called Molex that some people use also for fans. We had one of each of these in the case so you just gently plug them together make sure everything's lined up do not force it and then tuck it up under to get it out of the way there are a few other cables i'd like to go ahead and push towards the front of the case just so that i can go ahead and get those knocked out while i'm here messing with the power supply one of these is the front panel connectors they normally come in a little wad like this where they have an hdd power sw which means power switch and they're all kind of in one bundle typically you want to put these underneath the motherboard kind of on the left hand side and you kind of want to get them ready to plug in on the front later there's also a usb panel connector normally that you want to slide under the far right 
right side of the motherboard underneath there. And there's also one called HD audio that also goes up under the kind of right side of the motherboard. These are all when you're looking at the back panel. And the only other one we have on this case is a USB 3.0. It kind of looks like this and typically it's blue. Sometimes it's solid black, but it goes around the side of the case on the left-hand side of the motherboard, just like the 24 pin did typically. Some motherboards do run them at the bottom. So you'll just have to see when we plug them up here in a minute, what I'm talking about. And you can kind of figure out what you need to do for your case and motherboard specifically. Once I have all these cords kind of pushed to the front of the case, now we're ready to kind of plug everything up so that you're one step closer to getting that PC up and running. Now this is everyone's least favorite part of building a gaming PC and that's plugging up all the cables. We're going to start with the front panel IO that's in the bottom right hand corner of your motherboard. This motherboard specifically kind of told us where everything went, but it's typically the same on most motherboards. I normally plug in the bottom row first, starting with the HDD plus or minus. It goes in the bottom left of this little set of panel connectors here. And typically the reset switch goes right beside it. Then on the upper row, we have the power plus or minus LED, the plus normally going on the left and the minus going on the right, right above the HDD that we just plugged in. Just make sure all the names on these power connectors are facing upward because I had to flip this one back over here. And then the power switch goes right beside that all on the top row. And if you'll notice, there'll be one pin left over that you didn't use here. Now we have the front panel connected. This will let you use the power button on the top of your case. Now plugging up the other stuff is really easy. We have a 24 pin that's this nice big one here that we're going to plug up on the right side of the motherboard that looks like this. All of these connectors will only go one way, so don't force anything. Next, we have the CPU that's in the upper left. Make sure you turn it the right way as well and plug it in. The USB 3.0 is this blue one. It is very, very delicate, so please just make sure you have it turned the right way. There's a little notch on it. Make sure that's lined up and plug it in nice and snug. Next, you'll plug in your HD audio. It's normally the very bottom left connector here on the motherboard. Make sure all the holes are lined up and plug it in. There'll be multiple places to put USB. I normally just put it in whichever one says USB 1, and that's typically somewhere on the bottom row, more like in the middle at the bottom. Now that you have all the cords plugged up, what I like to do is kind of go back and push all the cords back towards the back panel. That'll help with cable management and it makes everything look nice and clean on the front. And we save the best part of building a PC for last and that's plugging up the GPU. Now we're gonna make sure that you get the GPU kind of lined up to this top PCIe slot here on the motherboard to see which of these little pieces over here in your case that you should take apart so it doesn't block any of the ports. Once you figure out which ones you should take, every case is a little different. Some just have to unscrew and slide out. Some you have to kind of wiggle back and forth and break the actual metal off. Once you've done that, you will kind of pull back the tab on your PCIe slot here and slide your graphics card into place. You will hear a nice satisfying click and your GPU is set. Then what you'll want to do is take a couple screws over here on the side and screw in your GPU so that it's nice and snug and will not go anywhere. And lastly, you want to plug it up. Depending on if you have one or two connectors on this GPU here, the 1660 Super. We only have one. We're gonna plug it up right here, nice and snug, and your GPU is ready to go. And you have this really nice, awesome $400 gaming PC built and ready to go. Next up, we'll be installing Windows and the drivers and playing some games. Now that we've got the gaming PC built, we're going to actually boot up into the BIOS before we install Windows, because there's a few settings we wanna change. The first setting we wanna look at is your XMP profile for your RAM. Sometimes it's DOCP, depending on what motherboard you have. Wherever it's at in your BIOS, we want to turn that on and enable it so that your RAM will run at the fastest speeds that you paid for. The next thing we want to look for in the BIOS is the resize bar, RE size. If you can't find it, there's normally a search function somewhere in the BIOS that you can search for it if you need to look for it that way. Make sure both of these things are enabled, then you can save and exit and it'll reboot your computer. After you do this, you want to power it back off because we're going to need it to be powered off to install Windows in the next step. Now, to install Windows, all you're going to need is a flash drive that's around 8 gigabytes in storage and some other device where you can download Windows. This can be an old laptop, a public library computer, or just, you know, go to a friend's house and do it. First, you're going to want to plug the USB into your computer, find it in the files, right click on it and format it. You can use NTFS or FAT32. I've seen both work just fine, but it will absolutely wipe out everything on the USB. So make sure it's one you don't want to use. Once you've done that, you want to go to the internet and find the Windows installation media. It's normally the first one that pops up when you Google it. Click on it and go to create installation media for Windows 10. I always pick Windows 10 because you've got the free upgrade to Windows 11. Go ahead and download that to your PC and then run it. You'll have to click a couple of agreements and then it's going to give you two options to upgrade your PC or to create an installation tool. We want to create an installation USB so we're going to click that and then it's going to give you the option to select the USB you want to use. 
we're going to use a USB stick and make sure that you have named it something where you don't accidentally delete your, you know, imported files. After you click through that and let it run, it is going to take a while, probably about 15 to 20 minutes. Once it's done, all you got to do is click finish, eject your USB stick, and you're ready to put it in your new PC that you just built. Now you're going to take your USB, plug it into the computer you just built, and power it on. It should boot up to this screen where you can click install now for Windows. You want to click, I do not have a product key, we'll cover that later. I always select Windows 10 Pro, that's my favorite version, I do not use the home version version at all, except the terms and agreements. Then here you want to click custom install. You won't have all these partitions here if you're building a fresh gaming PC. You'll just have one and you'll click on that and click next. Then you'll let Windows do its thing and it'll boot up like you just bought it from a store and you can set up Windows how you want. Now installing Windows this way is going to put a watermark in the bottom right hand corner. To get rid of that, I use SCD key. I've never had any issues with any of their codes. Before you check out though, you need to make sure you type in the code MPC so you can get your 25% off. It takes the price from $21.90 to $16.42. At most, it'll take a couple minutes to get your code and once you get it, all you got to do is go to your Windows activation settings. Just search Windows activation in the bottom left down at the bottom click change product key then type it in press enter and boom you have 100 fully activated windows 10. i'll have a link down in the description so you can just go straight to the website and get the code you need now that we're booted into windows we're going to install our graphics card drivers to make sure we get our best fps we have a 1660 super which is an nvidia graphics card so we're going to go download the geforce experience app just type in geforce experience go to the website download it and run the app you're probably going to have to make an account but after you do that you'll come to this screen here where you can click on driver where it should automatically recognize your gpu and you can download the latest driver for your graphics card. Once it's done with that, just click Express Installation, let it run its course, and you'll have the graphics card driver installed. Now for the benchmarks. We've tested this gaming PC while we were live streaming on TikTok and recording at the same time as we were gaming. We also tested it while we were just playing on our own with absolutely nothing else going on. We're going to compare the two and see how it went. In Warzone 2.0, without streaming, just playing on our own, we used the basic preset settings at 1080p with DLSS turned on. This was a super smooth and fun experience playing here we were able to get a few eliminations and we got over 100 fps with some drops into the 80s depending on what was going on you can't beat that for 400 dollars but while we were streaming it was okay on our end but our viewers did suffer on the same types of settings that we used when we weren't streaming we only got 60 to 70 fps and while it was okay with me playing it was very stuttery for the viewers as you can see here from the recording Next up, we tried Valorant without streaming 1080p on the high settings. We got over 240 FPS. This machine is way overkill for Valorant even, but it was absolutely fun. And while streaming, it was a pleasant experience for our viewers as well as myself. Our FPS did take a hit though. It only stayed around 150 to like 180 with some jumps into 200, but you could cap the FPS if you really wanted to, but it was plenty playable. And if you're going for content creation, this is more than enough. We tried another demanding game in Halo Infinite at 1080p, but we went with the lowest settings possible. When we were just playing and not streaming, it was pretty smooth. We got over 100 FPS on the low settings and that's absolutely great because halo is really tough to run streaming actually went better than expected the viewer experience was actually pretty good on halo we went with the same low settings but and while we were streaming and recording at the same time we were able to get somewhere around 60 to 70 fps now this is not the most fun experience as a player when you're used to higher fps but again if you're going for content creation you gotta draw the line somewhere if you're not willing to drop the cash. Apex Legends, while we were not streaming at 1080p on the low settings, we got around 150 FPS, but while we were streaming, it was kind of stuttery. We did play the Battle Royale, and it was very stuttery for the viewers. It was not that bad on my end, but it was very stuttery for them. We still got over 100 FPS, which was weird, so it could have just been something with me playing the Battle Royale. I really don't know, so Apex could go either way. And if you're wanting to be the next Fortnite superstar with gaming and streaming, this PC is absolutely perfect. At $400 without streaming whatsoever. We got over 240 FPS on performance mode with the view distance on far, textures and meshes were on low and that's all you need for Fortnite. Now, while you're live streaming, you're not going to get over 200 FPS. We only got around like 150-ish or so. Still plenty playable. If you're good at Fortnite, you're absolutely going to be fine with this no matter what and it gives you an intro into live streaming for a very, very cheap price. Now, this PC can definitely not stream Starfield, but it can play Starfield on low settings at 60 FPS. FPS if that's something you're interested in. All the parts for this PC will be linked down in the description. They will be affiliate links, so I do get a kickback, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. And if you think you might want a different graphics card, then you could go check this one out.